So before we be- begin, I, I want to talk about something a little sensitive, and I think it ties into the subject. Uh, it's it's personal, and it is something that uh, Tanner has wanted to come on and address for a very long time. Uh, and I do, I do think it kind of feeds into the broader topic that we'll be discussing tonight. Um, you know, Tanner, how old are you? I'm 22. I turned 23 like next week. Pull that mic. Just tilt that mic up for me, please. I'm 22. Okay. I turned 23 like next week. Okay, so you're a young man. Uh, you've you've lived a hard 22 years, to be honest. Uh, I've lived all of them. <laughs> right. Yes, especially the last few, and. Uh, a lot of a lot of discussion is going into, um, you know what what is basically lost young men and why do they turn to certain things? Right. Uh, and Kyle, you know we we haven't really done a good introduction of you, but feel free to kind of jump in as Tanner's friend as we go through this and just say like, hey, from my perspective, X, Y, and Z. Um, oh God! I'll give you I'll give you a better <laughs> introduction than hey he shit in my bathroom in a minute. <laughs> Um, this dude clogs toilets, right? Uh, so you you obviously you sound like a stoner. You have a stoner's voice. You do not use any drugs, correct? I, not anymore, no. Right. Uh, although I do, I will say right now I, I miss my marijuana, <laughs> um, and I'll get it back. Uh, Tad, one, do you believe that? Once this ten years is oh one hundred percent, I believe. It. Yes. So we one of the best episodes we ever had was our four twenty episode with Tanner oh, and man. James Neese. I think it was twenty. Is he still alive? Yes, twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen. And That's the last time I was on. Yeah. Well, m- maybe I think the next one. But Tanner, Tanner had a great episode where we talked about drug legalization and then dog the bounty hunter's wife. Yeah, and, and I just want to give her a shout out real quick. And you know, I, I heard they were uh, examining John Dillinger's body. And I have, Be- I've, I've got this crazy request. That Where's they, this going? They <laughs> exhume <laughs> Beth the bounty hunter's body so they can figure out how to give every woman her tits. <laughs> okay, stop. And <laughs> so, great episode. And so I invited you back. And what I didn't, like, I have never used any drugs. And so I'm not around drugs. I'm not sophisticated when it comes to any of it at all. I thought on your next appearance, you just got, you smoked too much weed and <laughs> you were just, you nodded off a little bit. You were kind of falling asleep. You were <laughs> acting weird. And like, I was just like, man, this, the edibles really fucked Tanner up bad. Right. And it came, you know, and a few, I don't know, weeks, months or whatever. You said, no, I wasn't, I was doing more than weed. Yeah. And so, yeah. What what were you doing? And I, I know first it's important to you to apologize. I, you've apologized to me, and I've accepted that. And like you were going through something, like you know. Oh, and, and I felt bad that you were even on once I found out what was happening because the goal is not to ever use you as a character. I mean, we're all about real people here, and I felt terrible about it. But like you know, because people kind of messaged me after going like, "Hey." That that, 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 fucking, that, that 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 wasn't weed. Pot. You should check on your friend. And right. so we kind of behind the scenes talked to family members and stuff, and said, yeah. "Hey, um, but the you know, it, I didn't realize you had a serious problem. Uh, it was very serious, and and you know, um, it it was one of those things that uh, I have a really messed up body the way it is. I've got a spine issue with my back." And at the time, I was dealing with an ACL reconstruction surgery, I right. believe, at the time. And, you know, I would use every excuse in the book. You know, it, it was this, it was that. But until you wake up and you cannot get out of bed without having some sort of drug in your system and you're a slave to that chemical, you don't really, you don't really recognize how serious your problem is. And um, honestly, being on this show was a, a big wake up call. Um, not not only to me, but people around me. Because I remember I had a doctor's appointment the next day, and I I went in there, and he had seen the episode, and uh, he was about to fill my anxiety prescription, and uh, he he was he said there was just no way that he was going to let me on that because he he knew that I was going to misuse it, mm. and uh. You know, and I I use all of those ailments, quote unquote. I I use them as an excuse 
to get messed up. And, um, you know, I'm really torn between the whole, the whole, uh, disease versus choice argument. And I don't believe people are born destined to get screwed up in life. But at the same time, I don't think people, some people realize how bad off they are until they wake up with a needle in their arm, you know, um, which, you know, March 22nd is two years. So, um, it's not an issue anymore. Thank God. But it, it took a lot of serious help to, to get where I am now compared to where I was at the time. So, so you started because of the pain, you probably, you started on opioids and then it ended in heroin. Is that kind of the, the trajectory? Oh, I, I started, um, 2015, I snapped my arm in half in a jujitsu competition, and I was prescribed 120 milligrams of hydrocodone, hydrocodone every day. I would take three Norco 10s when I woke up every morning, three at lunchtime, three when I got home, drove home from school, and then three before I went to bed. And then the doctors cut me off cold turkey, and then I couldn't find the hydrocodones on the street. I could find the morphine. And the morphine was a lot easier to find. It was a lot cheaper, and I wouldn't get sick from it. How how would you find it, and from whom? <laughs> I, I'm not gonna snitch on my drug dealers. I, I mean, but but like, was it clinics or was it just like private? It was street dealers. Like, okay, it was street. It, it was. Uh, what, why were you? Why did you two start laughing? But like, uh, what, what are you a fucking cop? <laughs> God damn it! What are you doing? I'm an arc. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not gonna say who or what who I was buying it from or. I can tell you the price I was buying it at, but I mean, let's hear it. Um, a hundred milligrams of morphine, which uh, is pretty much milligram per milligram, the same as hydrocodone if you take it by the mouth. Um, about a dollar or uh, a third, thir- thirty cents a milligram. So about a, a morphine hundred would cost about thirty dollars, mm. whereas a hydrocodone ten milligram would cost up to seven dollars. And I just, it, it wasn't able, I wasn't able to find hydrocodones on the street. And I ended up graduating to morphine. And then when I couldn't find the morphine, there was um, a heroin dealer. And I ended up meeting the heroin dealer. And uh, I tried it once, I snorted it. Um, ended up getting hooked like a fish, absolutely hooked on it. And then uh, I ended up putting it in my arms. Um, and uh, how long did that go on? Honestly, it didn't go on too long because I would have died. Um, I can, I can still see the look on my mom's face because there's a period there for about four, probably four weeks or so, where she knew, I knew, everyone knew what was going on, but I wasn't willing to accept that fact. And then there was just one day. I ran out of money. I there was no way I was gonna get 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 well that day, and um, that's when I I just decided to stop. I I didn't go to rehab. I locked myself in the room, told my parents what was going on, and I've always been a mama's boy. I'll admit that. Um, you know, I I just locked myself in the bedroom, and uh, dealt with the withdrawals and uh. About four, I think it was three or four days later, I was outside smoking or something. And uh, it felt like something just hit me in the chest. And I started crying uncontrollably. And uh, something just, you know, told me everything was going to be okay. And uh, it was like a spiritual awakening in a way, as crazy as that sounds. And uh, I, is it's weird because the day before that happened, a friend had asked me if I wanted to go to church with him. Mm. I was like, "There's no way in hell I'm going to church. I'm withdrawing right now. I'm trying to get off dope." And um, the week after that, I was at church, and uh, I still go to this day. I got baptized on July 1st of 2018, and uh, it's one of the best days of my life. So at this point, I can look back on that and. Uh, say it was a wild ride and I wouldn't change it for the world because I learned a lot about myself and I learned uh, compassion for others. Do you still struggle? I mean, do you still like, 
Uh, I mean, do you still struggle with your addiction? Uh, every great while, there'll be like, um, there'll be something that sneaks up on you. And it's almost like a bee sting. Real quick, it'll just come up on you and just tap you on the shoulder. And um, it's just something you have to block out. Um, I relapsed one time about six months in on morphine, not with heroin, but with morphine, which is equally as bad. And I've done every drug from A to Z. I've literally done everything. And um, <coughs> it, it it just, it, it's such a sensitive topic to a lot of people because a lot, pretty much everybody knows somebody that's going through it. And you don't realize how bad off you are until somebody else says, hey, you're fucked up. Mm. Or, sorry. You're, 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 curse, you're, really, yeah. you're really messed up. Yeah. And um, that that's when I really realized that I looked down and saw the saw the mark on my arm and had knew I had to make it make a change or I would end up dead. Do you think that it was just that it, it's like you you still weren't so deep in it but you were kind of cognizant in the beginning that you just were like I I, I can't I can't let this go further like this is serious shit. I mean He was this, aware. Yeah. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, he he would mention that he would want to stop, you know, but it was hard i mean obviously it's hard uh when you become dependent upon it just to get out of bed um yeah go ahead okay. the, yeah no uh, you're good and he'd mention it to me you know, often um uh, more directly into the mic though and uh and then finally he did it which you know, so what would he say to you he's like he's, he's like he wants he wanted to stop he yeah. wanted us he really wanted to stop he just he struggled with finding the trying to find the word the 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 fortitude to actually go through with it you know because it's such a difficult like he would have to lock himself in his room and you know and then that that's what he did i mean how many days did it take for you to get right um well see see during this time that we're talking about um kyle actually lived at one of the most toxic places i've ever been in my life really what in what way was it because he, of his he, shit? My roommates. Oh, okay. His his roommates yeah. were also... See, I tried to make a joke to lighten the mood, but they, they were... <laughs> <laughs> no, but, so your roommates just were, were selling, well, dealing? Well, what? well, I don't want to get into it's too not, much, yeah, but they were... No, fuck those guys. They, well, <laughs> Honestly. They, they weren't helping him, you know? Right. They, they weren't... They weren't helping anybody. You know, it, if you see that your friend's, like, really struggling, I mean, you wouldn't want to, you know, give them more dope. <laughs> Right. You know, but um, you also don't want to sit there and see them suffer. Yeah. And um coming off of an addiction, it's it's not good to be it, around people that are doing you know, the same that, shit. Yeah. It, it's completely impossible almost, you know. Um like just that feeling on, you know, day it, it if anybody out there's struggling with it, if you can put two days together, you can do it. Right. And at the end of the third day, if you're on opioids, you're going to make it. You just have to convince yourself that you're strong enough. You know, there's this, this, this fucking show. It's like the most serious, ep- one of the most serious episodes in a long time. Yeah, and then fucking, you toss a cat across the room <laughs> like a cam girl. I, I'm sorry, Tanner. I didn't mean to no, interrupt you. You're fine. Yeah. But, you know, I just want to be that person that I wish I had at the time. Um, it, at the end of the third day, you can do it. You just have to just tell yourself that you can. Surround yourself with positive people. Stay away from the tos- toxicity of others. And, you know, make make sure that you have friends that have your best interest in mind. And uh, at the time, I didn't have that. So what are some more ways that you've kind of supported yourself as you've worked through this? What What should people kind of look for in terms of, you know, there may be somebody listening right now who's going through this or, you know, even love someone who is struggling with opioids, you know, it, who it was more in the Kyle situation. What are some ways from both of you that what are good ways to support somebody in that situation? I mean, I, just, I, I was, I was more on the receiving end of, of the, let of me, the let me start here. Kyle, <clears throat> how do you deal with it emotionally, mentally, 
I imagine you just wanted to beat the shit out of him sometimes. You just wanted to go, dude, you're fucking up. Like, Tell the guitar but, story. But then there's other times where you're just like, it's a, a tremendous amount of empathy. Like, how how did you handle having a friend on opioids, wanting to help him, but knowing he's just being, the, he's in the disease right now. He's stubborn. He's not listening. Well, I know that if someone's on drugs, they're not going to help themselves unless they really want to help themselves. So Absolutely. I try not to take like a, I try not to be pushy with it. You know, I just give the best advice I can. And, you know, I just told him the way I quit cigarettes. Is I just quit. Like I, I had to make a choice to just quit. I told yeah. him, if you just got to quit, you got to want to do it. If you right. don't want to do it, you're not going to do it. And it's that simple. Um, and I just told him kind of, kind of the same thing you just said, you know, I explained it differently. I just used kind like of a being, shit metaphor. I yeah. told him, you know, you gotta, you gotta pick the people that you want on your ship with you. Yeah. You know, you don't want anyone on there that's, that's drilling holes. In, in your life and, and wanting you to sink. You know? And so when he was ready, you're you being a loving, empathetic person to saying, hey, like not shaming him for not judging him necessarily, yeah. just saying, here's how I did this here. You can do it, encouraging him. And then when it was time, he, he you were there for him and he knew he could reach out, reach out to you. Is that fair to say, Tanner? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, but at the end of the day, it wasn't Kyle's decision. Yeah, Kyle would have been friends with me whether I was strung out on heroin or not. It, it was my decision. It it wasn't my parents' decision. I could have slung dope my whole life, and made made myself um, get by that way. But that's not how I wanted to live. And after others started pointing out to me what was going on, it it made a lot more sense. And, you know, it, it's easy to get torn up in this argument. Is it a disease? Is it a choice? It's really, you know, I think it starts out as a a, a choice that turns into a fucking disease because nobody wants to wake up and have to stick a needle in their arm or right. snort a line or take a pill. But at the same time, you know, everybody makes that initial decision whether the doctor gives them the prescription or they buy it on the street. Right. And it, it escalated very quickly for me. And um I I think I think all this suboxin all this is just bullshit. It's just as addictive as the original opiate. I think that the I don't think the NA or AA any of that is really that important. I think you have to find a Nar- Narcotics Anonymous, an Alcoholics Anonymous, that stuff. Right. Okay. I've never been to a meeting in my life. I've had good friends. I've had bad friends. And that's what's going to determine your your outcome is how you surround yourself with people that you do, you decide to. Yeah. So if I'm going to go hang out at the trap house, I'm probably going to go do some dope. If I'm going to hang out with people that are like-minded that like that have similar hobbies that I truly had before I got into it, such as music. You're going to find me playing guitar, singing. That's what I do today. I, I play music. I think that's kind of relatable to a lot of the, the mass shooter subject and the whites, you know, white supremacist and ISIS. And like, it, it's a lot about what is the group of people that you're going to start surrounding yourself with, making that early correct choice. Absolutely. You know, I think in any situation, it's like uh, choosing to lurk on some of these websites and entertaining certain ideas that you know, like, ah, this is edgy, this is edgy. I mean, it, it leads to a dark place, going to places that you know you shouldn't go. I mean, everybody everybody has those choices. That's what I find so amazing about, like, the gun control argument. You know, it's not about, like, it's about young men turning to violence, and which is kind of what we're going to talk about. Uh, or people who use drugs or whatever. There isn't a person on the planet that doesn't struggle with something and has to make the choice every single day. Absolutely. Am I, you know, like, if you're a married man, are you going to engage with that girl on Instagram? Are you going to slide in that DM like when you know Damn you should? <laughs> right. You know, Thought Slayer 69. Are you going to make that joke to the per- to the coworker that you kind of know you shouldn't, but maybe she'll get the hint like uh help me. I mean, the other stuff <laughs> like everybody struggles with choices, you know. If, for me it was always emotional eating, it was overspending, you know, uh, I don't feel very good about myself right now. Am I going to go to Cracker Barrel and eat 5,000 calories or am I going to pray? 
Am I going to go for a run and exercise? Absolutely, yeah. What, you know, everybody has, you know, uh, you, you have coping mechanisms. Absolutely. And, and you choose good coping mechanisms or bad coping mechanisms. Go ahead, Harry. I forgot you were here. <laughs> oh, I'm saying, like, everybody has something to reset themselves, whether they got something constructive to reset themselves or something that's destructive. Right. Some people play video games. That's why some people, the first thing they come home, they want to play some video games because it's just some something they can do that's a little bit mindless to let them meditate. Yeah. Okay? I was like, well, they're just mindless doing that. Well, if that's how they meditate, let them meditate that way. Somebody, I actually just read an article that, like, some of these games, like, uh, you know, I play Clash of Clans and I play Fishdom, which oh, is Oh, you play stupid, Clash? Yeah. I have for like you know ten years, or uh, yeah, I really like. Um, I'm on there too. What 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 is Ragesaurus Rex? Ragesaurus Rex, that's a good name. Uh, Kingdom Rush, those mindless little games like that, or uh, uh, birds. I love Kingdom Rush. They're supposedly better for. Um, they're supposedly better for stress release than Calm and Abide and some of these other apps that are built for stress relief. Which Correct. I found I, interesting. I yeah, there's, there's nothing better than shooting people for oh, yeah, release paladin. digitally. Right. That, was like, a, you know. that was a joke. We'll, yeah. we'll address that later uh, at the staff meeting, uh, Tad. Yeah, Harry. <laughs> I, I mean, digitally, Harry. Everybody's got good coping mechanisms and bad coping mechanisms, and it really comes down to everybody lives in a moment by moment choice of Are you going to choose the decent path, or are you going to choose the path that indulges your inner your your base self? Shadow. Right. Yeah. yeah, and the other coping mechanism, like some of them use, is alcohol, which it shows also like Tanner's whole like uh, th- that uh, journey. If he, he would have been addicted to alcohol, locking yourself in a room would have killed him. Yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> it's it's hard. I mean, changing yourself is really hard, and and people shouldn't take that lightly. I mean, it's yeah, Tanner's in the bathroom, so I'll say nice things about him. I mean, it's very difficult yeah. what he did. I mean, what what kind of things did you do for Tanner through the process of getting off of off of it? I just kept telling him he can do it. Um, positive reinforcement. Um, you know, try not to say anything negative. Um, he he really kind of fell off the map for a little bit. Trying you know? to not say something uh, negative, I think, is key there. Um, yeah, because I didn't I didn't want to like discourage him because I knew it was going to be hard. Right. Um, so I just try to remain positive and, you know, he disappeared for a while, but I, I knew that was going to happen. Um, and then how, how long did it take you to get a hold of me after that? I think it was pr- soon after. Um, a couple days. I, I withdrew, I, I went through the withdrawals for, I mean, like, after see, see heroin is it after your withdrawals, heroin and morphine, both morphine's a little bit longer lasting drug than heroin. Except if it's in your veins, but if if it's in if it if it goes intravenously, they're both very fast acting drugs. Yeah, you don't feel them for a long time; they exit quickly. And um, I mean, the withdrawals last. The worst of it's over by day four. Mm. You're still gonna feel depression. You're still gonna feel like shit. Didn't you come over to come over right afterwards, like twenty first? Street. Uh, there's no way I, I wouldn't have been able to. I I honestly can't remember the f- the first time I seen you afterwards. Um, but I I remember after those four days were up. Af- I after the day I was outside and something hit me in the chest. I was bawling uncontrollably. I couldn't say anything, but there was a million thoughts going through my mind. The day after that, I remember waking up. Walking out of my room, feeling fine, mm. and uh, my mom was just uh, talking about how much it, it. It just looked like life had been restored in my body. You know, I, I'm not trying to sound like color in your cheeks and right, yeah, right. right. Where it, I, I wouldn't describe you as peppy, but peppy for you, maybe. Uh, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, no, I. I want to ask you about the after because you know you were at the party and you've been trying to get on for a while and I, I personally didn't want you to come on because I didn't and I know that the boss hog guys are of the exact same mind that we don't want this or the attention that this brings to do anything that might cause you any kind of harm but after kind of talking to you a couple times uh, I think it was almost like 
making amends, like you wanted to come and make amends to the audience because it was really important to you uh, to come and, and do that. And I think it was personally very embarrassing and you wanted people to know. Now, now so you know, like audiences are so fickle and turn over and pay so little attention. Like right, yeah. People barely remember right. the co-host remember. that I had for 250 episodes, you know? So I, I wouldn't think too much about that, but uh, I feel that you are having a, you're struggling a little bit with being perceived as an addict or having been a drug user or you, you, I think sometimes you think that our circle is judging you, that your friends are judging you for what you went through when in reality we have nothing but empathy. Like, because I mean, you're right. I mean, like you said, you thought it was too much edibles. I mean, I didn't know. I, 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 you've never touched touched drugs in your life. <laughs> right. Um, but over time, it essentially turned into a character. And well, yeah, it you, was a character you have a that I embraced. Yeah, you have a pothead voice. Right. And you smoked pot. And it was kind of like, oh, Tanner's eyes are red. What, did you get stung by bees? Do you need Benadryl? Like, yeah. Because you, you were, I thought you were just high on, on dr- It's a so, funny joke, right, Ted? I mean, really. Pretty really, good. Pretty I, good. I, yeah. It's a bee. So it's every, a bee. Every, every time I would do a podcast, I would just go and get as loaded as possible and come on the air and have a good time. Yeah. Which is, which is honestly why we haven't had you back on because we didn't want to, we didn't, we don't want to do anything that causes you stress. Right. Oh, I was not under any stress. I can promise you that. Yeah, we know. I didn't right. feel a whole lot of anything. Yeah, yeah, I didn't feel a whole lot <laughs> but itches and giggles. I, I just want you to know that nobody in our circle, and I've talked to pretty much all of it, all of, like nobody's judging you or thinks any less of you. They're all proud of you. There's no like negative consequences, really. I do think there are things that you did during that period that made some relationships a little tense, and you have to work through that. It's just the reality of it. It's like... You know, I have been a complete rage. Like during my divorce, when you're in pain or you're in a in a stressful situation, like you do things that you regret and you act certain ways that you like. I look back at certain points in 2015, 2016, and I am so embarrassed. Oh yeah, absolutely. like I'm just so embarrassed by some of my behavior and some of that period. Not you know, like it just was grotesque, and I I really do like sometimes think about putting all of the shows before the last 50, for instance, behind a paywall. Cause like, I don't want that version of myself out there. Well, I mean, how do you, how are you dealing with that a little bit? People still talk about that episode to me to this day. Yeah. And you know, nobody wants to be seen going like this, you know, right. F- falling asleep on the microphone and, you know, talking a bunch of nonsense. And, you know, like you said, I, I just got to make amends with this audience Three quarters of you probably don't know who the hell I am, <laughs> but the quarter that do, I want you to know that I love you. Yeah, I, and, I, and you can do whatever you want. I have not taken that down because Tanner has said not to take that down. Don't take it down. Go so, watch it right now. I, I mean, I, so if anybody's like, "Why isn't he?" T-? That's why Tanner wants it to to stay up. And I, th- I honestly think at this point it's an important part of your story. Absolutely, um, it, even though it's it was instrumental. In yeah. um in the recovery of myself, because then after that happened, see I remember uh, uh, all of us went out to eat after that episode, and they were going they you know they were just confused. They were like, "How's how's he getting home?" I remember them discussing. I can't tell you where we ate at. Stack pickle, I think. I mean, I I don't know. I yeah. just remember the conversation of how I was going to get home, and it was one of those, you know, you know, oh, don't don't worry about me, I'll be all right. <laughs> one of those deals. But truly, I had no business on the road. We genuinely thought. Well, you said I'll, I'm just going to sleep it off in my car. We thought you were drunk and high, and that you were going to take a nap in the stack pickle parking lot till you sobered up. See, I don't remember saying that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of what the discussion was. Um, yeah, so. Uh, it's just I, a I, fucked I'm, up story. Yeah, I'm proud of you, and I'm, I'm proud of you for, <laughs> and I know that it's not been easy, and I know there's been moments where it's just kind of like, uh, man, <laughs> it, it, it's re- it's got to be really hard for you. It's, how has it been on your family? Like, how do they feel about things now? Are they overprotective now? Oh, absolutely. Definitely. They they totally are, and um, 
you know, like during this time, Boss Hog was just a baby. Yeah. It was just starting up. And I was on the very first episodes of Boss Hog. And if you go look at those episodes, you'll see the same thing that you saw on whatever episode I was on here. Yeah. Maybe not as intense, but it was still there, you know. And um, I mean, now, now, you know, Newcastle's such a small town. It's it's almost it's almost like I just have to let everybody know that I'm okay because I think at that point nobody really expected me to be here very long. Yeah, and now I plan. I didn't expect on being here very long. So let me um, let me ask you this: like, kind of the maybe the motor. Like, you didn't. Did you have a messed up childhood? Did you grow up like? As far as I know, your parents are together. Like you have good parents. Your dad, I saw him the other night. Like he's a super nice guy. Yeah. Like it doesn't seem to me that you have a drug problem because your family life was a mess and you had all these. Like, I mean, did you? Where did you start falling into drugs and why? Like, was it just you were thirteen and fell into a bad crowd and everybody? Was it literally the gateway? Like, I, I, how did how did you fall into it? I mean, it was your it was your classic gateway story. It. It really was. I ate my first Vicodin. I was probably 14. No. 14, 13 years old. I drank my first beer when I was in second or third grade. What the and, um, How? I was actually staying the night at my friend's house, and his dad drank Coors Light, and he was a general manager at CVS, and he had a beer fridge that was always stocked to the brim with Coors Light. So... Was the dad your uncle? <laughs> no. no. I don't call, drink coarse light. I'll, I'll call him out right now. His name is Ron McGinnis. That, not, that was the man's name. He was general manager of CVS. And, uh, it's not, he did nothing illegal having no, beer in he, his he, own home. He had, he had no idea. Right. Well, he caught us a few times and thought that it was my friend's older brother. And then, uh, you know, we got into the marijuana and... I'm, I'm not trying to make this Dumb fucking girl, reefer right. madness bullshit, but if heroin was legal, I would have never got into it. I don't believe. Now, the pain pills, I mean, it was over prescription by the doctor. Hmm. If me medical marijuana was legal, I would have never fallen into this trap. I don't believe. I kind of feel like I fell into the pit that they dug for me. Hmm. Um, I mean, it's nobody's fault but my own. You know, it's not it's not their fault that they think that Vicodins are the 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 cure all for pain. So, yeah, it, it's just not. It's a band aid. And um, did you? And and I don't know if you want to answer this, but did you buy all of your pills from the street, or did you go to doctors or pill mills, or I mean? What was your experience? Did you hear about doctors who overprescribe and they, there's just these clinics that will dole it out no matter what you want and they're making money off of it and they don't care who they kill. Uh, and we should note that Tanner is from a rural Indiana county and Tanner's town and county is like a lot of America, if not yeah. most of America. You know, So his experience, I think, is probably fairly common. Um, and in this small town, I mean, were there places like that? Oh yeah, definitely. There, there were the pill places. Um, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. If, uh, don't don't, don't give specifics. <laughs> right. Uh, a certain doctor in Henry County, his medical license is suspended right now for uh, for uh, Medicaid fraud. Right. And that, he got away with some other stuff. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay. Otherwise, allegedly. Allegedly. This and is Tanner's opinion, not uh, mine or Tad's or Harry's. But allegedly, he's also the one that wouldn't write me the prescription for my anxiety medicine. But I know plenty of people that did get prescriptions from him that totally didn't need them at all. Mm. And uh, most most of the drugs that I bought were on the street, most of them. Now, I kind of got creative. Okay. And... um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I'm very proud of you. But uh, one thing I will say is I okay. never stole from anybody. 
I never fucked some old lady. Wait, what? I never did anything stupid. Ha- Harry, for my what does drugs. that mean? Uh, you can ask Kyle. He Kyle, didn't sell his Kyle, body. Kyle will attest. <laughs> I did not sell my All body right. for drugs. Kyle, is there a high demand for male prostitution in the elderly female community <laughs> that I'm not aware of? <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Trina All that Viagra is going to go somewhere. Oh, no, you'd have to hey. ask Tanner. And- <laughs> Trina Harrington. Tad, are you a secret male <laughs> escort to the blue, the blue crown? <laughs> oh, you know what? If your pubes ain't blue, I ain't playing. Is that your mono? <laughs> Remember, uh, uh, what was her name? Anna Nicole Smith? Yes. Yeah, I'm... You're the reverse. Tad Nicole Western. <laughs> All right. Well, again, the phone lines are open at 317-795-0325. So if you want to weigh in on anything, it has to be germane to the topic. Don't call in about just random BS, but uh, the phone lines are open. Uh, I am very proud of you, Tanner. I'm very proud of you Thank for you. maintaining your sobriety. Absolutely. I know how incredibly difficult that is. And uh, I'm I'm proud of you for coming on and telling your story and hope that that helps somebody else. And I, Kyle, I hope it does too. Yeah. And, and w- one fi- thing, go ahead, give your final statement. Final statement, you know, it halfway has to do with me. I've, like I said, I've done every drug, uh, and I will say that if you have a kid and you're thinking about putting them on Adderall, please do not do that. Why? I've taken Adderall and I've taken methamphetamine. I was more twacked out on Adderall than I ever was on the meth. Hmm. When I did meth, I felt dirty, I felt disgusting, and I couldn't wait for it to wear off. Hmm. Adderall was euphoric. It was uplifting. It it was a it was a wonder drug, you know. Hmm. And it, it's just, it's the same thing. I mean, it, it it feels almost identical. Yeah. And I know they say, well, some kids with ADD feel it this way. No, they get they get used to the feeling. It's like um, if I was to take, um, you know, twenty milligrams of caffeine a day, after six months, I probably wouldn't feel a difference taking the twenty milligrams of caffeine compared to none. And um, I don't think there's a huge difference between right. Um, Adderall and methamphetamine. They, they, when, when I took them, they acted the same. Only Adderall felt a little bit cleaner, maybe, mm. per se, you know. Uh, Kyle, any tips for, uh, people out there who may have a loved one who is going through what Tanner went through and they just don't know what to do? You just gotta constantly, well, I don't want to say constantly, but you just gotta be there. You know, you, you can't, you know, shun them away just because you disagree with what they're doing i mean that's that's the time when you need to be there most you know when they're yeah. fucking up and they're doing the shit they ain't supposed to um because i feel like when that happens and people get like that and the people that they love and care for or their family or whatever they 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 distance themselves from them it it sends them over you know and they just keep going. Or they I, isolation or they, is a very dangerous yeah, thing. Isolation is a bad place to be, especially when you're addicted to drugs. You know, it's, uh, so, uh, just uh, be there for them, you know? Yeah. Positive reinforcement. 